The early universe is now known to be homogeneous, amorphous. Yet we know today there are these pockets of incredible complexity of which you and I are prime examples. And yet we also know that science tells us that order has been decreasing. How does that make sense? Well, it's all rather wonderful, really. I think the, the whole point about science is that it turns explanations on, its, on their head <laughs> in the sense that you look round and you see something that's surprising and it seems to be unnatural. And then you strip away the surface and look underneath mm. and you see that, my goodness, it's natural after all. Mm. It's just that um, scientists are not deluded by appearances. They don't look at the the outsides of, of events. They look at the interior of events to see if they can understand the mechanism underneath. And the um, I mean, what we're really embarking upon here is the the second law of thermodynamics, that most wonderful law of <laughs> of nature, really. Um, I mean, the second law is almost the paradigm of of fear in science because it's a kind of litmus test of whether you were well taught or not taught at all or, and so on. Those who were taught by teachers who didn't understand things think it's dreadfully complicated. But in fact, it's the height of simplicity. And that simplicity accounts for the complexity of the emerging in the world. So describe that second yeah, law. Yeah, I will. The second law just says that things get worse, basically. <laughs> and everyone knows that. I mean, that's just a rule of life. But it, it, of course, it's much more sophisticated than that. It, what it talks about is disorder and the fact that there's a natural tendency for matter and energy to, uh, to spread in disorder, basically, to become more disorderly. Um, and, uh, what troubles people when they hear that statement, a very crude statement of the second law, is that they don't see how things getting worse can actually lead to creatures like you and me, these wee embodiments of great complexity, as, as, as you implied. Um, the reason is that no man is an island, and no event is an island. And so an event that is actually spreading in where where matter and energy spreads in disorder, may be linked through a variety of processes, which I'll talk about, to an event somewhere else in the universe. Might be an inch away, might be a thousand miles away. Um, but it's linked. And as the first process leads to greater disorder, it can drive the emergence of a smaller amount of order out of disorder somewhere else. I mean, the crudest analogy you can think about is um, if you had um, a heavy weight uh, connected by a couple of pulleys, uh, by, by pulleys and string to a light weight, and you couldn't see the heavy weight, and you just saw the light weight suddenly shoot up into the air, you'd say, unnatural. But if you take away the screens and you find that it's actually being pulled up <laughs> by a heavy weight, then it, you know, it's no longer uh, perplexing. And exactly the same thing is happening in the universe for the, if you like, the drawing out of complexity by events that lead to greater disorder somewhere else. So um, if, if you think of a fuel burning in an engine, then as the fuel burns, the hydrocarbon molecules split up into carbon dioxide and water. And so the, if you like, those, that matter spreads and the energy is released in the combustion, and so the, and the energy spreads as well. And if you can capture that spreading, which you do with pistons and gears and so on, you can actually drive the construction, for example, of a pile of bricks into a cathedral somewhere else. So long as, but overall, if you just look at the cathedral, it's like seeing that light weight jump up into the air. You're actually seeing this thing grow. But if you take away the screens, once again, you find that the disorder of, that is being generated in the engine, then you can understand that really things are getting worse 
worse, net, a kind of net effect. But locally, there might be abatements of chaos. So we have pockets of increasing complexity. Yeah, you and I are pockets. Sure. That's why we have dinner. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we eat. Yeah. Because what we've got to do is to take in stuff that really can decay through metabolic processes in our body, digestion and so on, uh, can decay into disorder, releasing the energy, releasing matter, and through, not this time through a mechanical gear chain, but through a, a biochemical reaction chain, lead to, for example, not bricks being constructed into a cathedral, but amino acids being constructed brought together and joined into the, into the elaborate structure of a protein. So you know, we eat in order to grow. And you could take, I mean, the most, if you want to take this almost a fanciful, but I think not truly fanciful heights, um, then you could think of um, the brain as really, when you're not thinking, as really just a collection of random electrical currents and so on. But because you have breakfast this morning and you've got this network of biochemical processes that can link into the decay of your breakfast, then you can marshal those electrical currents into a thought, um, a statement like this. This is what I'm doing at the moment. So, or an act of creativity, an, an, an artistic work, an act of valor, an act of stupidity, just an act. Mm. So I think um, there's, there's, there's really no problem about the second law and the emergence of complexity. The universe is getting more and more disordered, but the local pockets of it give us the impression that here and there, as at you and me, there is structure for me. What are some of the laws that generate that those local pockets of, of complexity? I think we would have to start with gravity, because the yeah, on the cosmic scale, yeah, cer certainly, right. yeah, um, and sort of enabling um, really the galaxies to condense out right. of a reasonably homogeneous um, medium. Yeah, and you know, there you've got the role of dark matter and, and, and sure. ordinary matter. And then, so on. and then as so that, that structures the um, the galaxies, and also the gravity structuring um, solar systems, really enabling clouds of hydrogen to right. collapse and, and and so on. This, um, in a funny sort of way, is not really the domain of the second law, right, um, right. because this is really. Um, Newtonian mechanics, really, that the, uh, the gravitational force is causing the stuff to combine and then ignite and give the, you know, the, the, the star at the center of whatever solar system you, you have in mind. And then when we get down to chemical levels, what are some of the principles that enable these local pockets of, of complexity to, uh, to, to, to develop? Well, that's a tricky question. <laughs> um, whenever you've got uh, um, uh, two reagents, let's watch we take two reagents, hydrogen and oxygen, nice, easy, yes. entirely important uh, reagents, and, and you, you mix them together, um, there is a tendency, f f if they were to form water, by uh, the hydrogen and oxygen combining together, then that does release a great deal of energy, which dissipates into the surroundings. So there is a tendency for hydrogen and oxygen, if they are in the same environment, to form water. No problem about that. Um, the fact that you can mix hydrogen and oxygen together and not get water simply means that you haven't initiated the reaction. There are certain impediments to reactions taking place. But um, there is always a tendency for hydrogen to combine with oxygen to produce water. Um, at um, a, a more biochemical level, is this, there's the process that I mentioned of amino acids being joined together to form um, a, a protein, absolutely crucial to all life in every, kind, every form that we know it. And processes like that are driven 
um, by what is effectively just little engines. I mean, you've got in every cell, um, you've got uh, ATP molecules, uh, tenosine triphosphate molecules. And basically, you've got this sort of tapo-shaped molecule with a string of phosphate groups along here. And when the last phosphate group just drops off, you, it, it's like that heavy weight falling. It can actually drive mm -hmm. your amino acids to link together to start constructing that protein. Of course, the, the mechanism that nature has adopted to achieve this is one of extraordinary complexity. But that's all it is. It's heavyweight reactions driving lightweight reactions. And so, looking at the overview, you have the second law describing the entirety of the process, the heavyweight and the lightweight, yeah. and then some of these specific kinds of reactions, hydrogen and oxygen, or different elect uh, electrochemical reactions that become the, the, the local mechanisms to achieve those pockets of complexity. Yeah. But overall, you still have that same... It's tendency. downhill all the way. I'm afraid there's, there's, no, there's no hope for us in the end. <laughs> we haven't, if you like, we haven't got an energy crisis in the world. We've got an entropy crisis. Yeah. Really, that's been what we've been talking about all along, because entropy is just a measure of disorder. And, but the trouble is it scares the living daylights out of people if you mention it. So that's why I've not been using it. But, but so really what the world is doing is the entropy of the world is increasing ceaselessly. But it's these local pockets of low entropy that are being generated. And you and I are those local pockets.